Thank you everyone for joining the Wild and Precious Life series. I'm excited for our first reader, Sarah Bedell. And so I thought you got something censored on Twitter. So I, I saw like one of the tags and that, that's sort of like why I'm doing this introduction because I was like, what's happening? Like it really piqued my interest because I don't believe in censorship. And out of all things, like to have a tweet censored from the things I see in my feed is pretty crazy. Um, so I, I think this was um, what you were mentioning. So you were doing an interview with Courtney on uh, the press page and she asked, what's your favorite poem from the collection and why? And you, this is what you had to say. And I'm reading this in tribute of you getting flagged on, on Twitter. I particularly love Dispatch regarding Big Dick because it's foul mouthed and funny, or I mean, it makes me laugh while getting at the ways working in K through 12 education can be so weird that people on the outside think you're making things up or exaggerating for effect. I also really love Dispatch for Redacted because I know what the missing words are, but no one else beyond my husband and two people I shared it with ever will. And that also captures something about the teaching experience. Teaching is so intensely personal and generates very intense yet time delimited interpersonal connections. And trying to explain those relationships is futile because they just don't translate to anything else in my experience. I am so happy that you are here tonight and sharing from your latest collection from Riot in Your Throat. So the screen is yours. Yay. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, so um, this is my book. Oh, you'll see it has stickers on it. Um, because when you publish a book, then you get a pile of them and they all look the same. And how do you know which one's yours? And this is what I did with my students. They all got books they could take home. And I would always put stickers on my own books. So they were my teacher editions. And then I started having kids do it too. And it was like, taught like 17, 18, 19 year olds. And they were like, these stickers are great. <laughs> um, so this is my book is Dispatches from Frontier Schools. Um, and it is five years worth of teaching in a toxic charter high school with also some of the best colleagues and teachers I have ever known. Um, so I picked poems from across the whole thing. Um, you, they'll go from the end of a school year to the beginning of the school year because the arc is five years. The first poem is Dispatch Regarding You. Um, it's got an epigraph from The Wolf by Giovanni Verga, which is this teeny tiny short story um, set in Italy with a woman who's like a, a sex fiend. I don't know, but it's like rural Italy in a century ago. The wolf saw him coming towards her, pale and wild eyed, with the ax gleaming in the sun, and did not retreat a single step, did not lower her eyes, but continued to walk toward him with her hands full of red poppies. I first learned to teach in jail, and then I taught Sarah Lawrence undergraduates how to teach in jail. If you are a teacher, you can already guess who was harder to wrangle. If you are not a teacher, let me tell you about the school's secretaries from when I was subbing in the suburbs. I showed up early and most made small talk. Some inexplicably treated me like a nuisance. But whenever I said I had just moved home from New York, that I had been teaching in the Bronx, those women, two a one, Ood and awed over my saintliness for teaching those children living there. That must have been so hard. The school was eight stories high with 4,000 students on roster and a little over 2,000 showing up daily on a good day. I worked hard to develop ways to humanize my students in a sentence or two for these secretaries. You should have seen them in their prom gowns and tuxes, I'd say. Or more often, oh no, they're just kids. Just kids, it wasn't a thing. But it was most definitely a thing. I cried all the time. My friends quit or were fired every year. The kids sometimes dropped out. And I only knew because one day they stopped coming. And a few weeks after that, their names would disappear from the Scantron rosters. 
what would it have looked like instead to humanize myself? If you are a teacher, you know this double bind. If you are not a teacher, let me tell you about Carlos, who drew me a gift, an anthropomorphized sexy wolf woman with a crop top and pointy ears and long sharp teeth. He labeled it the wolf after the main character of The Wolf by Giovanni Verga, which we were reading together. The drawing is pencil on notebook paper. It has been punctured by multiple pushpins. Almost all I have left of those years anymore is a question. Which of us was the wolf with hands full of blood red flowers? Which the desperate man with the ax? Um, I published, I promised a poem about cupcake cake and I'd like to deliver on my promises. So this is dispatch regarding giant eagle cupcake cake. This time last year, I was a substitute teacher with no school to call home. I intruded by request and left as little evidence of myself as possible. One day when I was subbing ninth grade English, the afternoon was an assembly, a dress rehearsal for the musical. I sat alone, useless, because even if a kid misbehaved, I knew no one's name, had no power. The overture began, the cat in the hat rhymed frantically on stage, and then through the back doors of the auditorium burst the rest of the cast, singing and singing. I couldn't, I sobbed and stifled it. Today I watched the lip sync at our advisory Olympics, felt the same surge of tenderness and grief push up my throat and blur my sight. We sat around the table in the break room a few hours later, discussing the kids who simply cannot pass, who are not capable of meeting the standard, who need so much help and care. We ate a cake made of cupcakes shaped like an ice cream cone. We dipped our fingers into the piles of supermarket frosting. First me, then our guidance counselor, then Principal Osborne, then me, then Ms. Long. The sugar, the fat, it was too much, so sweet. I ate till I gagged, I stifled it. I didn't turn away. I ate more and more shoving sugar down my throat because giant eagle cake will never taste like anything but home. Giant Eagles are a grocery store. Um, it shows up a lot in the poems because also the school where I taught is in an old, I'm told it was an old busy beaver, which they then converted into a school. So it's in like a strip mall and the giant eagles on the other side. So there was often um, cake and donuts and whatever, whatever we wanted, we'd run across the parking lot and grab it. <laughs> uh, also a family dollar, which will show up in another poem. This is the other poem I promised. It is Dispatch Regarding Big Dick. That's my, that's my kid, their fan. <laughs> I am fuzzy with rye and heating pad. Yesterday, Ms. J walked into a chair or a desk and she swore in pain. Shit, dick, fuck. And just so many dick jokes to be made. But I went with, you know, I could really use some dick right about now. When I bought another bottle of rye at the state store tonight, I thought of Claire, who I worked with at Tara Mandala. She was broke and we went to Whole Foods. She bought a giant bar of Kiss My Face. Big soap for the money, she said, holding up the bar to her face. I grabbed the big bottle of bullet from the shelf. Big rye for the money. Our welcome back speech from the CEO last August was a long, long speech about baseball. And I couldn't listen anymore because I don't give a fuck about baseball, but it ended with 17 inches. 17 inches is our motto this year. Apparently that's the size of home plate. And something, something, we don't change the size of home plate, whatever, it was a bad analogy. And I couldn't follow after the eight minute anecdote about a ball player from decades ago. But boy, howdy, how many times did she say 17 inches? 17 inches. 
we at Frontier are committed to 17 inches. It's hard, but we persevere. A long, hard year. A nice big dick for the money. Dispatch regarding the circle of power and respect. At morning meeting, standing in the circle of power and respect, Mr. Barnes told us he was not coming back next year. I can't explain how this cleaves the building, collapses the center of the circle, except to say two years ago, on a day of reflection, with a rowdy, disrespectful class of freshmen, I yelled loudly at kids I did not know to tell them what a remarkable man stood in front of them. And they disregarded his presence at their own peril. I would never be as kind as Barnes. I will never be as good as Barnes. And now we've used him up. I've come to understand that this is the job too. At the beginning of every year, there is no time to breathe and the body will give up pushing to get through. In the middle of the year, I will learn how to really teach. This class, this book, this routine, this central question, but the end of the year will always be an ending. How many people will not come back? How many will leave because they cannot push through and that short reprieve in the middle is not enough? Can I keep doing this? Waiting for the beloved to leave, waiting for a new beloved to emerge, wobbling through a center that will not hold. Um, in my class, I taught a senior English class that used critical theory to read texts. And we also, um, one of my favorite activities was to bring in pictures from the news and we would analyze them through our different lenses, what details come up. So um, the Brett Kavanaugh hearings happened while I taught. So we talked about the Brett Kavanaugh he hearings and um, the kids are all right. Like for the most part, the kids are all right. So this is dispatch regarding the moon. On mornings like this one, I try and fail to capture the moon. I know too clever by half, but it's true. It hovers just above the giant eagle, a white eye like the vultures, bright but hiding behind a nictitating membrane, pocked, bewitching. And the photo is nothing, never more than the distant moon, always less than the obsession. Brett Kavanaugh's face is at the top of all the websites, pale, white, only a hint of red on his snarl. In class, I project pictures of Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas alongside Kavanaugh. We compare and contrast, and the kids are horrified by this man, these men. I imagine Kavanaugh's spittle splattering the stand. It would be a joke if it weren't so painful. C asks if he will be confirmed, and I tell her, yes, he will. There's some small chance still, but it's clear. His performance will succeed. Behind the mask of rage, another mask of certainty. Or maybe there is no mask and male rage is inseparable from power. I tell C later that she was in my dream. We were in my classroom and I was holding her hand, pulling her along behind me as we ran out and down the hallways. Why, she asked, and I said, oh, a freshman in creative writing was being attacked by someone, a bad man, beyond the parking lot and the flowering bushes behind giant eagle that smell like summer. We ran through the front doors across the parking lot. Abruptly, I stopped and turned back. Where are you going, dream C asked, dream me. The withholding moon again above us, beneath our feet, shimmering in the dew-kissed asphalt. Inside, I said, shrugging, it's too late. Dispatch regarding stabbing potatoes. At lunch, we watched a video about how to stab a raw potato with a straw. You aim 
past the potato and shall follow through as you stand. I wonder often if this is real life. I wonder what would happen if I didn't come back, didn't teach the freshman in my advisory who won't listen how to stab a potato clean through with a straw. Another day at lunch, we all laughed about how we'd each imagined on the road in the early morning, the asshole speeding down the highway. And we wondered, you know, if I got in a car wreck, at least I could lie down for a bit in the quiet. What would giving up look like? A teacher with a potato in her hand, surrounded by a classroom of 14 year old strangers who have forgotten she exists. All right, and then this is my last poem. Um, it's about Empire Records. Uh, I was wearing my Say No More, Mona More t-shirt earlier today, but um, I, I dressed up for the reading. Uh, this is Dispatch, We Mustn't Dwell, No Not Today. Bless Netflix for Empire Records, even though I already have it on Blu-ray. My friend Joanna from college watched it and said, I don't get it. Flippantly, I told her it was too late for her. But then I meditated on why it's such a soft blanket, a cozy fire of dancing flames. It's like how Mr. Murray bought Ms. Long a SpongeBob popsicle from the family dollar on Friday because he knew she loved them. And there they were in their cotton candy flavored glory at the checkout as he waited to pay for his chips. Like how the joy spread across her face as she picked SpongeBob's bubblegum eyes. That was my timer. <laughs> like how the joy spread across her face as she picked SpongeBob's bubblegum eyes off in the staff lounge to save for later. That is Empire Records. The tattooed gum chewing freaks love even as they fight and their beloved record store succumbs to amoral corporatization. Yes, they do think they're so happy and so goddamn great because they draw together like a family hunkered in a basement waiting for a storm to pass. We are waiting out this storm. We are laughing in the staff lounge at how Murray saw a bird eating a chicken wing in the parking lot. And even my colleagues who do not look for metaphors and everything understand the grimness of this one. Are we drawing together for support or are we eating each other to save our personal hungers? We laugh again. We do not question, for we mustn't dwell, no, not today. When the credits roll, and one day they will, we know we will dance on the rooftop with hands joined. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I also think that we need to have dispatch writing Big Dick as a broadside. I just feel like that's broadside energy as well. I'm just saying, Courtney, fundraiser, broadside for that. I would totally buy some as gifts. Just planting that Big Dick seed. That didn't really work. I, I was trying to make a joke there. It didn't work. But Courtney, fundraiser, you should do it. Um, next up is Karen, Carolyn Oliver. Carolyn, I have to also give a couple shouts out before I do her introduction. Um, I've published her work in Lempris. I, I love her work. I, she's been a finalist two years in a row. I, and each poem is just so vastly different. Like, just like you have the multiple voices. Like, I just love your work, obviously. Like, I Thank you. And, and Carolyn is also going to be um, in Let Me Say This, the Dolly Parton Poetry Anthology. So excited about that. I'm um, excited too. There were a couple things that struck me in some interviews. And one is really short. So I'm going to share two things because it's really short. Um, but you were asked back in 2020, what is your favorite part of the writing process and what's your least favorite part? And I liked what you had to say, which was, I love revision. I hate first drafts across the board in any genre. My first drafts are miserable. Revision is resuscitation. I loved revision is resuscitation. That's very beautiful. Um, and then actually this year, not that long ago, you did an interview in July um, and you were asked about your writing process. 
um, and your thoughts on things like solitude versus community. And you said that I'm a scattered and slow writer. If I can finish a poem in a week, that's a good week. A phrase or a subject or a title, I rarely get a whole line at once. Usually it needs to percolate for a long time, a month, a year, two, three, before it bubbles up into a draft. Flash fiction feels looser, more playful. That tends to come faster. Longer fiction takes eons. I'm largely a solitary writer by inclination and circumstance, though I cherish my writer friends and enjoy listening to or reading craft talks. Zoom readings have been such a gift, especially now that they can be captioned. And I'm glad for the experience and insight of editing a literary magazine. The Worcester Review has provided. And I have to say, she says that, but Carolyn has two chat books out in 2020 and a full length out in 2020. So she may be slow to write, but she's got three books this year and that's not doing <laughs> Um, so Carolyn, thanks for being here. The screen is yours. Dustin, thank you so, so much um, for inviting me to be here and for everything you do to connect poets and writers and for just the sheer volume of publicity that you've done, that you do for so many people and for this series. I really thank you so much. That's so kind. And I am a very slow writer. Of the, I'm going to be reading from this book, which is my first book from the University of Utah Press, which just came out. Um, last month actually um and I am the kind of writer where it's very slow and for me it just it when it rains it pours and I got really really lucky and I think all the writers in the room know you never know you might never be published ever again there's no guarantees so but this is seven years worth of poems at least so um I don't really know how to describe the book it's not a real summarizable book so I'm just gonna start with the first poem <laughs> which is my son asks if I would rather live in a house infested by bees or a house infested by koalas. Late summer, hurricane scraps batter the crab apple that didn't bloom this year, peeling open a paper nest high in the branches. Pitiless, I hope is empty, hope they're gone, the wasps. All these hot weeks, they've refused my offering of flocks and milkweed sunflowers and ruby buckwheat. Instead, they've stocked the raised beds of vegetables I should attend, patrolled the deck, skimmed my neck for a flinch. Allergic to my father as a child had a friend whose mother died, suffocated when a wasp or a bee stung her throat. So my son's question, survival means koalas on the stairs, lamps turn boughs menthol in the mouth, means marked territories and the slow click of claws in the dark days safe in a house full of sleep. But sometimes, it feels right to tell you this, sometimes inside the storm, I want to touch the tremble of a colony warming its queen. I want walls seeping honey. I want a willing tongue. Um, Dustin mentioned that I have a lot of voices and I do like persona poems. I write quite a few of them, so here's one. This is St. Agnes meets a hawk on the river's edge. Hawk, my lamb is lost, she says. Her voice is a piccolo the hawk could grip between two red talons. Where have you lost your lamb? The rain tastes like moss and smoke. There's nowhere I have not lost my lamb in forests and caves in dwelling places. The river sediment stirred, disturbed, remembers winter. A bird in hand is worth one bird, one bird exactly. I could be your lamb, my feathers soft as fleece. What's the use in hunting through the storm? The trees grow from their own martyrs. Hawk is too familiar. The girl does not reply or cannot. Her hair grows and grows, enough to make a rope to the other shore or a nest. And I think the next poem I'll read is called Hip Check. Art gallery in winter. My son taps my arm in warning. Before I believe, I see the wasps circling the window's blue heat. When one lights on my wrist softly, my mind fails. An easy rush of wild trust that cold will protect me, simply alter my chemistry as an artist's hand sweeps over charcoal, turning slashes to shadows wrapping a curved figure. 
Some gold afternoons, I fear this falter was a portent of my mind to come. Logic lost or pliable, no vigilance enough to save memory. In the gallery, etchings tremble and I am reckless, marshalling a round breath to blow the wasp away. But steadfast, it sways, the moving metal of its carapace scraping a bracelet's bezel over my skin. I'm recalled to myself. Don't gasp, don't scream. To the wasp, I'm merely warm, unsweet. No one wants a scene. Winter, thronged halls. A boy, a hockey player, on the way to choir, likes to take my hand. Laughing, he aims and with his hip, slams me into the lockers. No one else remembers how every time the bruise rose blue, a target, a boy's rough sketch of a girl's breast. Uh, the next poem I'm going to read is called Do Not Fail to Yield, and it is based on the Massachusetts Driver's Manual. It will surprise some of you and none of you that I do not have a driver's license. The facts are simple. It does not matter how much you try to be careful. The speed of your body cannot serve you. You can never predict when a crash might happen. The best way to protect yourself is restraint. For your own safety, do not be fooled if you reach the object. Unless you accept responsibility, use a red cloth when it's snowing. A little courtesy will not kill you. Plan for the turn. Avoid being hit by wreckage. Remember, you are only a witness. At some point, you will have to deal with your body. Theft makes it more difficult to respond to sights and distance. You may be dangerous, the true name of escape. Regardless of where you are, join the procession. Allow the animal to pass. Your body will keep moving until you have cleared forest or open field, fire, salt water. Lose possession of your being. You do not need to provide proof. The most serious problem is facing a half hour after sunset to a half hour before sunrise. Smoke near the crest of a hill, moved slow, solely by animal power, work your way down gently. Salvage the unexpected hazards. Be patient. At your own peril, tie a white cloth around an animal someone is leading. The phrase, give your name, means moving violation. You must go when it is safe. And uh, here's one of the Eve poems. This book um, has a bunch of Eve poems running through it. And it became, it was started as a little game where I was trying to write poems about Eve in various situations involving apples or people who are connected to apples. And then it spiraled out from there into all sorts of strange way things. And most of the poems in here are dialogues that require two voices and I only have one. So this is a monologue. Eve makes a target for William Tell. Tell me, sharp-eyed William, what is it like to sink your bolt through your Lord's neck? Were you so hungry that you ate the apple afterward, watching his chest forget to rise, brushing the worst of the dirt from your half, giving the cleaner flesh to your son? Nameless the son, nameless his mother, were their eyes lucerne blue or dark like mine? Tell me, what is it like to outswim the storm? What is it like to have so many ways to die? And uh, the middle section of this book um, is a section about grief and allergy. Um, these next few poems are for Eric Van Cleef, who was a wonderful poet um, and a wonderful human being. He was my fiance and he died very unexpectedly a few months before our wedding when he was only 25. Uh, so there's a bunch of poems in here about that. Somewhere a shark, scarred moon hulk, tangles its wake with jade ice finds nothing promising, rotting, retreats to deeper cold, cradling sea its trawled, slow as waiting since before Antietam's corpses putrefied and were photographed by Lincoln's leave, a sea it will sieve for death until we consume ourselves. While parasites devour its eyes to filmy white, hanging tassels pilfering the ice billows, taking the light, not all at once, but by patient gradient from surface to below as low, just as I have assembled this creature I'll never face and neglected to remember from which side of the bed you've reached for me that first blue morning. This poem is called um, In Another Life You Live and it's part of a series of Another Life poems that Dustin has read a couple of them actually. Um, and this one is actually the one that is the least Strange. 
in another life you live. And you are the one writing this poem, mid-morning in a sonnet-sized room, tempting window propped open with a student's abandoned Norton, the rest of last night's blueberry pie half finished on a smudged plate, your mouth a little purpled. Dull pencil drums on your neck while your wayward elbow, oh dearest elbow, is about to send a cup of black coffee sailing. Outside, the wind makes hollows in the willow boughs. A spill of goldenrod halos the creek. And in Spondees, girls fight over the basketball. Dare you to intercede? Maybe you will. Once this word appears, the one right word to hold how fine it is. Summer come again, salt heat echo in an upstairs song. Local peaches from once achieving their peachy promise. But now your skin kisses the cup. Suspends a sense faint, fading, now fallen away. How strange it is to have lived so long. And the last poem in that section, although it's not quite the last one I'll read, is John Donne and Leonard Cohen at the end of the world. In the unholy light, stripping the horizon bare, the poets eat oranges and olives, the kind gun grew a taste for in Cadiz. I didn't think the end would come so bright, says Leonard, and that voice like smoke settled in rafters or a rock slide paused. At his touch, oranges melt. Out of golden lines at last, Dunn nods, cleaning his oily fingers on a bit of shroud. He pours them both another ruby glass. From where they sit, could be a pulpit or a tower, they watch the slow sky of beaten gold collapse like a high note held until it thins. World drunk and bottled dry, they are two rakish hats receding into the dark. Leonard lets slip a bit of peel. Like a lover or a saint, it falls forever on its knees. Now, switching gears completely, um, I'm going to read this poem um, called On a School Morning in Mid-October. And there's a friend in the first line, and that friend is here today. On a school morning in mid-October, I called my friend who lives in the mountains, and while we talked, I paced by the window, my attention caught not by the two pines, their branches pitched high to block any glimpse beyond the cottage whose red door's been shut since the owner died some months ago. No, I couldn't see past the mauve hydrangeas because a man stood there pointing a gun, a long gun aimed into the muted blooms. Between us, cruisers and blue trucks swarmed, closed the state highway, spilled out more men laughing. For a long time, nothing happened but the rain. The armed man disappeared, the others too. The red door held back a secret. The storm covered its tracks. And the men returned, hunched, no guns, just tarp in their hands, hauling 600 pounds of still and silent moose toward the waiting pickup wedged in the gap of the neat stone wall. They heaved, heaved, and in she slid, Snug against the tailgate, her head was bound muzzle to ear in hunter's orange to stop her bite or send a sign, unclear. From our fences, the motorcade snaked west for woods, a place to walk, to wake, joy, the moose. I was telling her, my beautiful friend who lives where the big pines graze thinner air, I was telling her fear is part of it, that sweetness siphons off its weight, sweetness that wakes us early on the last golden maple morning before the wind arrives. Or I tried to tell her, but found my throat just then, I couldn't lift the right words out. And I'm very sorry to embarrass my son, who I know is watching, but I'm going to read the C-section sonnet, which is called Nine Minutes in June for Horatio. My son insists he hatched from an egg. True, they cracked my shell and scooped the yolk of him from me, the scrambled rest all draped askew atop my hollowed belly, just a scram of blue between my sight and what I made in dark months. As they scraped me clean, my arms quaked, spread empty wide. I wasn't afraid of anything except the world's old charms, bees in their hives, the storm that ends the drought, the taste of wine when love's in short supply, slick roads at night, a flash of island out beyond the swells. No lizard mother, I, dearest hatchling, how often would I break myself for you? Here's one wide scar, one ache. And now this will be the last poem that I read. It's the last poem in the book. And I just want to say thank you again for everyone who's here. And thank you again, Dustin. Midlife. It might have fallen 16 years ago or five or yesterday. 
But if I were asked, I'd conjure a soft morning nine years from now, in late October when the sun hasn't quite surrendered, when the cold marbles the air like veins of fat through meat. And in the season's last pursuit, the weary bees attend the nasturtiums, the wavering turtle heads. By then, I might have learned temperance or one of the minor virtues, like leaving well enough alone. By then, I might have learned to accept some hard things, absence mainly, but frailty too and censure. By then, I might have learned to coach, coax my courage out into the open. See, there's a stranger just off the bus, clutching a bag of small apples. No, they've spilled, scampering over the lawn with something like life. Laughing, we go together, gathering them back as I regret the skin of every stranger's hand I've missed, the fruit of their low, warm voices. Overhead, the hawks circle. The stranger slips away. A brute wind shuffles the leaves, scrabbling for purchase. In a parched marigold clump, one crimson apple remains. Glossy peel breached, wide seam of white flesh, tenderly harvested by nimble tongues that taste and taste again, as if they can take all that sweetness and make it last. And on this soft morning, nine years from now, the days behind gone hollow, the days ahead milling, buzzing in their thousands, waiting for you and watching the bees drunk on the stranger's gift, I could answer, yes, this is the time the place to end and start once more. Let me be born again here with the laboring bees in the last throes of their valiance. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Carolyn. It was a treat. Before I introduce our final reader of the evening, I'm going to do two plugs while I have everyone's attention. Um, so Reading Queer is a fabulous South Florida organization that does workshops and you don't have to identify as queer. We love straight people too for the workshops. So straight people, you are welcome. Um, the workshops are donation-based. So, you know, you donate a dollar, you can get in, but even if a dollar is going to impact someone, which it could, that means just message us and we'll make sure you get in the workshops because the point of these workshops is to make them accessible to people and then to pay the writers that are leading them. And so our next one, one is going to be with Jennifer Maritza McCauley, and she's doing defying categorization, writing short forms. So even if you are, say you're only a poet, I still think you should register because there could be some things you could pick up. And I also just love that Jennifer went to school in South Florida. And when I booked her for this, I did not know what I'm about to say. She was actually an intern for Reading Queer. And now here she is leading a workshop with Reading Queer. And that melts my little ice queen heart a little bit to know that full circle has happened, so register. And then the next Wild and Precious Life series reading will be on September 28th. I am partial to one of the readers because she is my mentor um, that I had for a creative writing class many years ago. How many years? It's not important. Um, but Beth Gillis is my mentor and dear friend. And she and Jennifer Wheelock and Kathy Carlisle will be reading um, from actually a book that the three of them wrote together. And this will be the first time the Wild and Precious Life series has had three featured readers that all co-authored the same book. So that's exciting. I'm a nerd and I like first. So I hope you will tune in for that. So I am going to introduce our last and fabulous reader, Dion O'Reilly. And Dion hosts the Hive Poetry Collective, on KSKD 90.7 FM. You can go to their website and download as a podcast. So I just have to give Dion a shout out for being a good literary citizen for what she does with the Hive. It's very much appreciated and she's pretty fabulous with her interviews. Um, Dion is the 2022 Glitter Bomb Award recipient from Limp Wrist Magazine. Um, I try not to get emotional about this because it's a it's something that's near and dear to my heart as Limp Wrist is my my magazine and because of awesome people some who are even here tonight who make donations we've been able to increase the prize each year which it's only been two years by a hundred dollars so we're going to keep going up a hundred dollars on the prize um, and having distinguished judges to be the final judge of the contest the initial Inaugural contest was Dorian Lux, and this year was Denise Duhamel served as the 22 judge. So it's pretty exciting. And I'm so thrilled that Dion is here for that. And I was like, well, 
there's so much I could introduce you with Dion, but I was like, well, if Denise Duhamel picked my poem as the winner, I think I would just want my intro to be what the fuck Denise Duhamel had to say about me. So for your intro, I, which you already know the words I'm going to say, I'm going to make sure everyone else knows what Denise had to say about your award-winning poem. I found the value of tears to be utterly taboo, transgressive, and thoroughly human. The speaker, as a young, sick child, recasts an early, possibly terrifying experience with a mother in a transformative way. The spare couplets, mother, child, pleasure, pain, illness, relief, give way to a final one-line stanza, which is a good, which is as good a definition of poetry as any other. Tears falling in to my singing mouth. Thank you for being here tonight. The screen is yours. Wow, thanks, Dustin. Um, thank you for asking me. And I just love all you do. And I loved interviewing interviewing you. And that podcast, The Hive Poetry Collective, um, it's a group of women in Santa Cruz. And we all do podcasts. And you can find it on Spotify or anywhere you get your podcasts. And we interview all sorts of people from Gregory Orr to Dustin, <laughs> just all different kinds of people. So thank you for mentioning that. I'm going to dive right in. This is my book. Um, let's see, let me change my view here. Oh, speaker, for some reason, I don't seem to be appearing as speaker for some reason. I don't know why. I'm going to start my timer. Okay, so here's my book, Ghost Dogs. And I'm just going to read a few from Ghost Dogs. I'll jump right in with this one. X. I glimpsed him leaving Trader Joe's, loading his disposable brown bag of stuff into his wax buffed jag. My X. His face dehydrated now in the way of those old timey apple, hell, apple head dolls. This was the guy to whom I cried as we did it. Take me any way you want me. So loud an exaltation that it carried for acres into the neighborhood chapel where it shivered the sainted windows all the way into abandoned apartments, awakening tweakers with their smoky pipes, into the fragrance of espresso bars serving absinthe and squirts of whiskey syrup, the pierced baristas pausing as they plunged the steamer rod into the teased up milk. That's how it is when you're a woman in your prime. You vocalize, especially after all the years I spent with a man who walked out the bedroom door while I waited in bra and panties, posing to show the curve of my waist, the peach lace of my Victoria's Secret, my jars of vulva bomb going rancid on the bedside table. After my great plague of nothing, the first to uncork the fine champagne of my lust, there he was again, his blotched arms heaving Frisky's cat food onto the smooth leather of his back seat. So um, I, have a, I have a few funny ones in the book. I like that one, um, but I got some, like every poet, I guess, like many poets, I got a few nature poems. River Vale. We slammed screen doors. We set out shoeless on paths of powdery sand, smelled the pockets of cool air with rank with black mud. Maple trees leaned in and dropped leaves that rested like bruised hands on the skin of the water. None of our mothers bitched out tasks. No pimped out sisters or fatherless boys. No patch eyed stepfathers drunk in lazy boys. Gone the smell of spilled beer and rat turds. We learned downstream. We learned leaving. We learned someday. 
Herons lifted their great bodies from the, the stream bed, shining fish caught in their tapered beaks, and the agony twisting in the air made sense. We looked to the world beneath the clear surface with its teeming minnows. We pushed shin deep through the creek, crawdads hiding, black pincers pointing out. We snatched steelhead and trout. We drank the water. So the book has an arc, a redemptive arc, and all along the line, animals play a big role in that arc as they appear in this, this one called safety, safety. No bone snapped clean, no bare breast chested bully, no bell calling you in, no blaring heat, safe, your blood warm, abandoned dog at your feet, a husband who loves you, like a bird's nest of careful eggs. You can stand blank, letting light beam over the battered face of everything, the barbed nettles, tarred leaves of the bay tree, the pitter of river birches raining their catkins. You can feel how broken you are. You can't be happy in all this quiet. It frightens you. Knowing salvation is a point of light the eye follows downstream, not God, not the angry men you fell in with, not the mother who silenced you with backhands and bruises, not the bile green bitterness you learned to carry close like your own beloved. How can you forget the look of the sky as they beat you, telling you nothing of the beauty in your flesh. You've heard it takes one person loving a child for a child to survive. And you say, even if it's just a dog, it might be enough. The wind you listen to, the thin limbs, whatever it was that was given you that you don't know you have. So that's all I'm going to read from that book. I'm going to read a couple from my next one that's going to come out in 2024. Um, and um, I like to write in form. So, oh, I wasn't planning on reading that, but ah, I will. <laughs> I like to write in form. So um, I have a lot of pantoons and sonnets and sestinas. And here's a sestina. Sister Sestina, hard to believe. Once, all I wanted was to be pretty, to be loved. My older sister's body was made of men. Desire drunk men gilded with belief in the pull tide of her body. I saw it so often, I wanted it too. I was not loved, only beaten. But I wanted to be pretty. I knew I'd never be pretty never unravel men, pull their love from their throats, make them believe what they wanted was the ruby heat of my body. I was told a woman's body was a sting, to be pretty, a scorpion, to be wanted by the ember eyes of men, a witch made safety. I believed what I was told about love, but it brought me no love, no light in the hollows of my body, Back then, my sister believed our mother's incantations. Be pretty, let your scent ensorcel men. To be wanted was all she wanted. Maybe because we were beaten, love became the breath of men. When our beaten bodies lit them with panic, we felt pretty, believed. We didn't want to be sisters, only bodies, safe from the whip, loved, pretty, Men would split us like fruit, believe us. <clears throat> okay, um, <laughs> this one has a long title. The title is Springtime. The dog jumps on the bed and bites you as we fuck and I feel young again. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm sorry, sorry. I, I always laugh when I read that title. I'll have to read it again and start over. Springtime. The dog jumps on the bed and bites you as we fuck and I feel young again. Sometimes I prayed, Jesus, let me sin again. I couldn't help it. Look at the iconography of my tribe. Long hairs nailed up like rock stars, saints starving like hot models, half naked, full of arrows. The royal blue beauty of the crying mother, her arms crossed over a bleeding heart. Like the single mom I once was, bored of my kids, tired of staring at the slide, waiting for an accident. An eye watched me all day as I bathed the filthy, added cheese to dimpled wafers. Night bulged, darker than water. But today, the house is quiet. Just you and the meddlesome dog whining like an archangel. Kick her off, lock her out. She can pester the door. Babe, let's start over. I'll pull you in, my old body dry as a copperhead. Let's fight with pitted eyes and razor spurs, then sleep into each other until we're grafted apple trees, the softness of our petals becoming wind. <clears throat> oh, here's one from the bad old days. Some guy. I'd agreed to this coupling in his closet sized room because he was named Guy. And I liked the idea of that. My first guy was named Guy, I would say, like a child's excuse for breaking something. He was my next door neighbor at Pleasure Point. Surfing had shaped his tra trapezius like flesh wings. This also stirred me. I think I thought men closed the wounds in a woman's body. But when it happened, I felt the ache of seeing the moon up close through a telescope, knowing I'd never touch it. My mind wandered as he drilled and pumped. I thought of irrigation pipes I jammed together on the ranch, then pulled apart with a twist to move to a different field. The next day, he saw me in my yard lifting a trellis. I knew it was almost telepathic. If I raised my arms, he'd be cruel. Your armpits are too wide, he said, and walked away. I felt like a vase in the home of a hoarder when I needed to be prized on a mantle, proud of itself, picked up and polished. If I couldn't be that, I wanted to shatter. <clears throat> when I was 19, I was in a house fire and I burned off 80% um, of my skin and I lived. <clears throat> and I have in my both my first book and my second book, um, some poems about that. So I thought I'd read a couple of those. This one's called Burned Body Contemplates the Bottom Sheet. Not razors, exactly. More like powdered glass, gunpowder, asbestos maybe, super glue. So when I moved, it wrenched the dendrites of my skin. I had no skin. I'm sorry. I had no skin. What I really mean is the sheets were slim silver whips as slim and silver as millions of threads stitching their silver through what shouldn't be seen. The undergarments of flesh should be secret. The body is a fruit which should never be peeled never eaten by air, never touched behind the thin curtain of its cover. The sheets were touch. 
not touch. There was no touch. There was diamond bright rake and flay I sank from into the dark red halls and caverns of my guts to the proper hush and flow machine of a living girl. Breath, nephron flow of urine, pancreas ooze of insulin, the wish, wish, wish of the heart crying itself out to the sheet, the sheet holding me. Blessing the burn. So when I stood in flame, I centered in its eye. And when my skin and then my muscle phased to air, I felt the commandments of organ and bone. And when the ambulance rolled in, I saw its jumbled white suns trading places, its wine pressing the sky too late, too late. Then I saw an old friend drove it. He whispered my name like a saint's. Oh, in that moment, I knew the world saw me. Then the long slow began. A groom, a rindless mass. But finally from my feet, where she'd worked for eternity to thread a needle where my skin was whole, a woman stood. She was the first to hunt a speckless vein. Oh, she mired me in the surge of a blue world, its countercurrents, its careless need. Oh, I'd burned, I'd burned hair to heels, but my face was the unseared seed of my le next life, and my breasts were barely tinged just sparks around my nipples like stars. <clears throat> I am so grateful that um, there has been this movement to make gender more fluid because I have never felt like a woman. <laughs> And it's always been confusing to me. And I've only written a couple of poems about it because it's so hard to write about. But this is one. Um, and it's about my dad, but it's also about <clears throat> that non-binary thing I got going on that I don't really understand. Born a girl, in me lives a mustached man. He's always the boss always swaggers the playground. In me lives a little man who loves big men and mean dogs. I can't help it. I was witness to a father's hunger, sky wild for my mother, his fingers rubied for her. She hung him like a horse thief, clipped the foaming stud he stole for her, made him cry in a darkened garage. I wasn't what he wanted. Man child who'd ride with him, enter his swinging doors like a god, pack a mean left hook back to back in a parking lot. Oh, little father in lift shoes, even on your deathbed, you griped about my sex. Old man, I admit it, I like you. Starting fights and duking it out, still alive inside me. Now I'm gonna read one of the last poems in uh, Ghost Dogs. Ghost Dogs, it's called Another Happiness. Publish your best work, find a decent job, eat some sizzling octopus, the many kissing tentacles meaty on your tongue. Success, you think, joy, for a while anyway. Then it's another mess in the papers, the endless scroll of rapists and dead turtles, another photo of a world leader with his corn-baked face. So you go on a car trip north to find some good rain. You get to Seattle and the lawns are scab brown. Your old home on the lake, a lime green high rise. 
always looking for something. Answer keys, antidepressants, more friends, another dog, another slim poetry book where the poet keeps pushing and pushing, line after line of exquisite description, one astonished metaphor after another, escalating into an ecstatic revelation. You can't write like that. You don't read enough Virgil and Milton. Don't start your day writing lines of iambic pentameter, Detroit, 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 Detroit. And you can't meditate like some of the big names do. When you sit, it feels like termites streaming in and out of your arteries. On the screen of your inner vision, all your arrogance, ecstasy, and gloom, your crappy conversation with the bitches in Zumba gold, telling you to irrigate your nostrils, get therapy, put a prong collar on your mutt. But admit it, sometimes in fall, you look up and see an arrowhead of duck flight, lonesome and luxurious. If only you could understand how fungus flowers from the mind of the land, how fractal arms of trees shard the sky. If only you could exult in ash falling, the west on fire, it would be like you just arrived on earth. I feel like I just arrived on earth. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. That was so fun. Thanks, Dion. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot. Would you be okay? I know we're at time, but I would love for you to read your glitter bomb poem. Would you be open to doing that for us to close us uh, out? Yeah, let me find it. Um, was I supposed to read that? You know, <laughs> that poem, um, let me find it here, hold on. That poem, I don't, I'm a little embarrassed about that because it's really, um, it's really a poem about my mother. <laughs> um, well, if you're a comfortable reader, you don't have to. I don't want to put. I know. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Let's see. It's called "The Value of Tears." It's a poem about my mother um, raping me. I mean, I don't know whether it's my mother was out of control, um, and that's like it's the only poem I've written about my mother, uh, butt raping me. And you know, I'm really like happy that a poem about my mother butt raping me won won a prize <laughs> like that is so healing that like I got a whole bunch of money and I won a prize about a poem that my about my mother doing that so anyway um that's what the poem's about and I'm not sure that Denise understood that <laughs> uh but anyway I'll go ahead and read it the value of tears sometimes I glimpse it Compassion for my mother who placed me on my hands and knees in a cold, empty tub, who entered me from behind with her enemas, her waxy plugs, who forced the pleasure of my release and the gut nausea that came before. Yes, yes, sometimes I see it, a deep, early love for her lost in the chestnut swirl that flowed from me. Yes, that's where I see it, mixed with sick, lost, lost, down the open mouth of the drain, and also falling from my eyes into my singing mouth. Thank you for sharing that and just for writing it. As someone who has experienced the trauma of rape in a much different way, when I read that poem, it struck me on such a level. And I am so appreciative of you for being a voice and speaking out about that. So thank you for reading it tonight. Well, you know, it, it was funny because all my life, I never, um, I always went, wow, I'm one of the few women I know who hasn't been raped. And then all of a sudden it occurred to me that I had been. Um, so 
but you know, poetry is so redemptive um, because we can reframe it and get this kind of communication around it. So thank you for giving me this, uh, Dustin. It really means a lot to me. It meant a lot. It was just overwhelming, really. Thank you for sharing your work. Everyone, this series only works if I invite readers and they say yes. So thank you to the readers for saying yes. And then the second part is it only works if people show up too. I mean, I could record it and it would still work, but it's not as fun seeing people commenting in the chat and seeing all the names on the side. So thank you so much for helping me continue this series, what we started in April, 2020, and now we're gonna be going into 2023, already booking out. So thank you for keeping this series afloat and attending. I appreciate it. And I appreciate you supporting poets, like I said, in the chat, I'm gonna put once again, everyone's websites because poets have often consulting services, all kinds of things that you can purchase from them. So look them up, save those links. When you're wanting to support a poet, please check out their websites and, and purchase a book for someone that has been in this series. I do have to say also did not because I was so caught up in Dion winning the Glitter Bomb this year that I also forgot to mention Dion is also, and let me say this, a Dolly Parton Poetry Anthology, so excited. Just so happened that like we have some, the Limp Risk Glitter Bomb with, with two of the reasons that was not planned, it just happened, the, the way the world works out sometimes. And thank you, Sarah, for being here with Ryan Your Throat. I, Courtney can do no wrong in my book. She is amazing and I love her press and what she does and she is, there's never been a reader that is ever disappointed from that press and you have kept the tradition of being a fantastic representation for that press. So I just wanna thank everybody again for being here tonight. Um, be safe out there. Get your monkeypox vax if you can, even if you're straight, be safe. Still um, get COVID boosters if you need to. Shit's still happening, people. So be as safe as you can. And I hope you will tune in on September 28th, which will be three months in a row of all features being um, female or non-binary readers. So I'm also stoked about that because this series is also, I mean, fuck white man. I'm a white man, but they don't need any promotion. So I just love that um, we focus on diversity and women in the Wild and Precious Life series. So tune in next month to keep that rolling. Have a great night, everybody.